Welcome to the Steady On Stronger Together podcast. I am your host, Angie Bauman. Today's episode is a virtual book club discussion in which I am joined by three lovely ladies, Lisa Wood, Maria Jessup, and Scarlett Pearson, to discuss the book, I Will Not Fear, by Dr. Melba Patilio Beals. It tells her story of being one of the Little Rock Nine who integrated Central High School in Little Rock, Arkansas in 1957. It was hard to read Melba's descriptions of hate, death threats, and horrific displays of racism, but the way her faith is woven throughout her life experiences is both inspiring and encouraging. Let's listen in. Good evening, Steady On friends. Welcome to the September virtual book club discussion. I am Angie Bauman, joined by my beautiful friends, Maria and Lisa and Scarlett. Welcome, ladies. As I forced them to read the September book. No, not really. <laughs> not really. Hey, we always take uh, suggestions go. for uh, books, yeah. but I will just remind you gently, there's only 12 months in the year, right? So right. many books, <laughs> and so little time. This is <laughs> right. And it, if, you, if you happen to be new to Steady On or the Virtual Book Club, we have a discussion once a month and we generally switch back and forth between fiction nonfiction one month fiction one month nonfiction and so um this is our this is one of our non-fiction months and our book this month was i will not fear by dr melba patillo you think or patillo what do you guys think Beals. Beals. <laughs> Sometimes a double L is, I should have listened to, I should have, uh, oh, yeah. I should have listened to someone introduce her. I did, I did watch a couple of interviews with day. her. <laughs> I, Beals. All right. Good night. <laughs> <laughs> oh, why? We don't know how to say, I listened to a couple interviews for her and I didn't even think about like, Hey, wait a second. I have to say this. So here's the, here's the yes. premise. Uh, Dr. Beals was a member of what is known as the Little Rock uh, Nine that integrated uh, Central High School in Little Rock, Arkansas in 1957. And so just real quick, I'm gonna read to set the scene this evening. I'm gonna read the back, um, just a couple of paragraphs from the back so that we kind of all get the idea of where we are and really the focus of our conversation and what um, we kind of talked about as we wanted to discuss tonight was just how these like really like big, scary, what's another word for, you know, significant intense. life mark intense yeah life mm. markers kind of in our life um can help grow our faith and mm. i think that's one of the things probably even though we have not all been in this kind of storm thank goodness right, right. Uh, i think we can all relate to how when the storm is raging right what do we go to and so i think mm. that's what but i, I want to read just a little bit so it says in 1957 melba beals was one of the nine african-american students chosen to integrate central high school in little rock arkansas but her story of overcoming didn't start or end there. While her white schoolmates were planning their senior prom, Melba was facing the business end of a double-barreled shotgun being threatened by lynching, with lynching by rope-carrying tormentors. Okay, I'm just gonna stop right there. The abuse and the harassment, right? In the first part of this book, when she described what it was like as she was trying to just like physically make her way into the school. Mm -hmm. What about, were you all just horrified? Horrified, yeah. horrified. Yeah. Horrified. Yeah. yeah really, um, a couple of scenes in the early book, she and her mother in particular, if I'm thinking of the right place, right? Like really were afraid for their lives, yeah, right. just trying to get out of the car or walking. I can't mm -hmm. remember and get into the school. So, um, this, the back of it is not overstating it, uh, learning how to out outrun white supremacists who were ready to kill her rather than sit beside her in a classroom. Only her faith in God sustained her during her darkest days and helped her become a civil rights warrior, an NBC television news reporter, a magazine writer, a professor, a wife, and a mother. <clears throat> in I Will Not Fear, Beals takes you on an unforgettable journey through terror, oppression, and persecution, highlighting the kind of faith we all need to survive in a world full of heartbreak and anger. And isn't that, I think that's where it's level, right? Because we can all relate to heartbreak and anger. She shows how the deep faith we develop during our most difficult moments is the kind of faith that can change our families, our communities, and even the world. I heard somebody say one time that we develop the, the faith that we need in the hard moments in the everyday moments. Mm -hmm. I'm not saying it very eloquently, but I, 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 he said it better. But I remember that I'm like, you know, that what we're building today in our life as we build our faith is what's going to be there when we face these moments of like, what, how did they describe it? Uh, 
heartbreak Intense and horror. anger. Yeah. <laughs> right. Yeah, yeah, it really was. So, um, yeah, so that kind of sets the scene of what we were, what we've been reading. I learned a lot of history. Mm -hmm. I didn't, did you all know? I mean, of course I had heard of the Little Rock Nine, right. but um, Scarlett, you're, you're a, well, Marie's a teacher too, but I, um, Scarlett teaches older kids and stuff. Is this something that you knew about very much? I knew Put you on about the spot, it. I yeah. guess I didn't realize, and I think I had said this earlier to you, Angie, that like it only happened for like a year. Yes. And then they built that brand new school just so they wouldn't have to do that again. Yeah. Like a yep. year. That's that blows my mind mm -hmm. that she that 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 the the horrible things that happened to those kids happened every day mm -hmm. or a year. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And then they Every, didn't go to school the next year to yeah. figure out where they were going to go to school. I mean, yeah, because they shut the school down yeah. and they built a They're private like, school that only the white kids could afford. Basically, do I have that right yeah. enough? Yeah, mm -hmm. they built a brand new school and they couldn't go there. And the NAACP asked them to sit out while they figured out what to do, kind of. That's probably a simple way to explain it. But yeah, so she so she went one year and then she set out a year and then transferred uh, to a different school to finish yeah um so uh absolutely yeah I, I didn't realize that it all happened in a year i i watched uh while, while i was reading it or after um on the oprah show years ago she had i think maybe seven of the nine i'm not sure she had so, and, and some of the white students who tormented them oh, um, wow. was on the show if anybody's interested in that oh, i wow. recommend it it was really mm -hmm. eye-opening but the one the, there's one of the little rock nine that got expelled for yes uh, retribution is that the right word like yes. you know to she was kind stood of up. Yeah. she stood up yes. for herself and yeah. she poured mm -hmm. some soup on a white child's head i don't remember if it was a girl or boy and um and they expelled her for it and it was really interesting because she was one of the ones on there and um and they had some of the there was one lady that apologized for because she was one of the ones she didn't do physical things but she was one of the ones that always was the racial slurs and the hate words and all that stuff and she talked about her upbringing and she talked about how since when she was a small child even like she was taught to to, to hate um, yeah black i was people. just gonna say that yeah and um and you know the one question that i don't remember which one from the little rock nine that they asked her and they said have you done better with your children that's what they that's what they mm -hmm. ask isn't that interesting and she said i have and um and i'm sorry you know what it was really touching so if anybody's interested in in that i it was on youtube it's not hard to find probably oprah winfrey little rock nine i bet you'll <laughs> I'll bet you'll find it right away so it um, was one of the things that i thought about a lot in it the kids that were taunting them and um that's too weak of a word but uh -huh. um they had to learn that somewhere you don't just mm -hmm. you don't just do that mm -hmm. their parents were telling them you know and the mothers were getting together and you know mm -hmm. forming groups on how mm -hmm. to educate their kids to be mean and that was it was like a it was like a pta or yes. like a mom's group or something where you where they got together yes mm -hmm. to educate their children mm -hmm. how to not integrate and i thought one of the um interesting things to me was too there were nine of them and they separated them for all their mm. classes so they wouldn't be together in any class. And the principal said something, I think it was the principal that said, you wanna be integrated, you'll be integrated. Yeah. With, you know. And so they just like divided them up. And it was a huge high school. Do you guys remember how many the students, like three stories or no, five stories tall in like a whole block of the city or something. Yes. It was a huge school. Yeah, mm. so in my mind, I, I was picturing it as a huge school, but uh, anyway, so yeah, that's kind of the, the book that we were reading. And I just had a couple of questions for you guys really about faith and just kind of exploring this because it did make me think about how when you go through rough stuff it kind of it shines a light on where we are with our faith does it not sometimes like um and how fragile it is i c.s lewis i think it's in his book a grief observed correct me if you guys know better writes about how his faith was like a house of cards like you want you think that it's so solid sometimes and then something comes into your life and it like collapses yeah. like a house of cards and you have to like rebuild it then. And he's like, this is what faith is like. Like it, you know, it's not so often it gets shaken and blown over and um, it falls down part of it, you know? And um, I think that's true sometimes for us when we're in the midst of something really hard. But in the story, Melba's grandmother was a huge influencer in her faith. Yeah. That was probably her closest connection even more so yeah. than her mother, wouldn't you? say um, absolutely yeah and so i just wondered you know how do you guys think having people who are what i would call ahead of us on our spiritual journey 
how is that helpful during challenging seasons? Have you, do you guys have, or have you had spiritual mentors, people who really could speak truth, you know, spiritual truth in your life when you were really struggling? What's that like for us? They're sitting in these boxes for me. <laughs> I think that's good. <laughs> yes, they're sitting in these boxes for me as well. Yes. Uh, but, <laughs> so it's not always about age is what you're saying. Yeah, right? it's right. not always about um, age, but yeah. That's right. I will say, Mel, I, I keep bringing this movie up, but uh, Melba's grandmother reminded me very much of the character in the war room that mm. with the power of prayer and instilling, I think there is something to be said when we, as, as generations go on, instill that. And I know from my perspective, my grandmother's family were believers and Christians and they instilled that in her. And then, you know, so I've grown up in, a, in that. I've been blessed to grow up in that, in that, and my grandmother still to this day at 92 is a prayer warrior for our family. Um, you know, she had seasons of, of, of not, but, um, yeah. And our, and even my son said the other day, like, you remember, that's what she does for us now. You yeah. know, she prays mm -hmm. for us because that's what she's able to do. And I mm -hmm. said, you know, you're right. And there's some wisdom in there. And so, um, I think it's huge to have, you know, and, and, and that we need to respect that of them. You know, I attend a church that has some older members and we have to, you know, reach out to them mm. and, and give them due diligence sometimes mm -hmm. to speak into us. So. Yeah. It made me think I, it, I not, this is just kind of something I'm like, God's really working on my heart about right now anyway, but I don't, I don't have this much in my life and I really haven't ever. And I think part of it is because I, there's a piece of me that feels like I don't deserve it. And I, and I've, I've thought about that as like, I need to, I, I want to do better than that. But you know what I mean? Like to ask somebody to help you in that way, to, to pour into you in that way. Um, I'm like, I think that's probably something that's missing in my life. I did have a, a mentor when I was in, uh, when I was in licensing school, a professor of mine actually, who kind of took me on a little bit, like in a, like in a good way, you know, and stuff. And he, especially after our car crash in 2010, he sent me some emails um, when I was pretty low with my faith that at the time I thought were kind of kicking me when I was down because he was really pushing on me, you know, um, and uh, but now I see it as such a gift that he was willing to really encourage me and say, you, you have a choice to make here. <clears throat> Mm -hmm. And you're making a choice of like discouragement and defeat. Mm -hmm. And um, there's another choice. And you need, you know, if you're going to make that choice, it's yours to make, right? God doesn't be, you know, he's not going to keep you from making a choice of discouragement and be defeat, but don't make it and not realize you're making it. That, and that was kind of, you know, and I, I think about that then, because it, it really helped me get on a different path. Um, I, I think times, Melba, yeah. she kind of went through that, right? Because when the grandmother passed, mm -hmm. she was angry at God. Yes. She couldn't imagine why God would take her away from her. Mm -hmm. And at times she needed her. And as she kind of came around, she leaned more on the teachings of her grandmother, you know, yeah. and remembering to mm -hmm. pray and remembering that God's always there. Mm -hmm. But that, I think that would be tough. And that was a tough time for her. It so. was, you know, go ahead, Maria. Yeah, I think I was, I'm glad Lisa jumped to that because I was a jump there too. I think mm -hmm. that to me, what that said was she leaned on the coattails of her grandmother's faith and hadn't really made it her own yet mm. like her grandmother and we do that as parents yeah. our children have to take the faith for themselves mm -hmm. you know and it's at some season of at some season of life you know and it's usually a circumstance could be a circumstance but yeah so i think kind of what andrew was saying earlier her house of cards fell a little bit mm -hmm. because she'd been riding through on her grandmother's faith mm -hmm. and then she's like now wait a minute what, what this is what this feels like you know when she's not here how do I make this my own? You right. know, who yeah. Is, who how do I really make it me by myself? How yeah. do I make it real for me? I, I remember the, the moment really I was in my car. I was, I was driving on route 13. Like when I, I don't even remember if I was listening to music or whatever. Um, and I really felt the impression of the Holy spirit, you know, say, um, your faith has to be your own. Like I was, I was in college, probably like late teen, early twenties kind of thing. Like, and it was just this like awakening, like church isn't your faith. Uh, your father's ministry is not your faith. Yeah. Um, there's not, there's nothing about anything that you've been like, what you've, how you've been instructed will serve you well, but it does not, um, it does not connect you to me. Mm -hmm. Right. I remember that. And that oh. was really like eye opening for me as I, as I realized that I, I, one of the things that I thought about though, was 
I mean, she was a person of faith because of, you know, but yet what you're saying is true with the house of cards, Lisa, and the, you know, how much she struggled and how angry she was depressed. I think too, mm -hmm. that was the year her grandma died. It was also the year she wasn't in school. And so mm -hmm. I think she was bored and she was depressed and she was angry. And yeah. I thought it was good of her to write that because I think it encourages us. What do you guys think about this to know that other people who are strong in their faith also yes. struggle mm -hmm. when they yes. come up? Yeah. What do you receive encouragement from knowing that? Or why is that encouraging? You think to know it? I was speaking of um, just the fact that like the people that are ahead of us are kind of just like physical reminders that like we can do it too. Mm. Like, you know, like I see my friends struggling with some really sad situations in her life and I've seen her get through things before. And so I know she's going to get through this as well. And so in my mind, I see her doing these hard things and I think she can do it. I can do it. Mm -hmm. It's just, mm -hmm. I don't know, just a good reminder. Like mm -hmm. if they can do it, I can do it. Mm -hmm. well, one of you others were going to say something too, or no? Um, I, I was, you forgot. I, I kind yes, of no. forgot. <laughs> no, I was just waiting because I like, I thought so there were profound. two of you talking at the same time just, and then there was nobody just, talking. That's her, dead her, her talk. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> I, I, you know, it had to do with her Constant grandmother. Um, I forgot what the question was, but to constantly, um, her, her grandmother constantly reminded her and, um, I didn't have that really in my life for somebody's mm -hmm. always saying to me, mm -hmm. God is always there for you. You mm -hmm. know, God will take care of you. God has plans for you. It's okay. So it is encouraging to me for someone who had all that poured into her to still, to still struggle, still yeah. struggle mm -hmm. with it. Yeah. Yes. I definitely. thought one of the things her grandmother said that I just picked up on and I loved it. He, she said something along the lines that, you know, you're so beautiful to God, your yeah. pictures on his refrigerator kind of thing yeah. like that, just that sort of. And yeah. I thought, and I think she referred to that a couple of times of that mm -hmm. bringing her comfort and peace to like, yeah. I am seen because what, what that really says is you are seen and known. Right. Yes. Mm -hmm. And so in this midst of, I don't know if anybody else has been not like this, I'm not saying, but yeah, I've had right. a very difficult season at school, more than one, mm -hmm. uh, where I, as a young girl, I went to school every day, hating it and, um, not feeling comfortable there, not feeling, um, accepted, just, not, it wasn't a safe place for me. And, um, and when you have to do that and endure it, you find things to hang on to that remind you, you're going to get through the day, you know, and for her, one of, one of those things was just that image of her picture being on God's refrigerator. Mm -hmm. And I just thought that was just, I thought it was really sweet. Oh. I think you're going to uh, also yeah, go use ahead. the ever important uh, power of scripture. I yeah. Mean, she taught her to hide scripture in her heart and, mm -hmm. you know, cause that is the, our belt of truth, you know, mm -hmm. and that's mm -hmm. the truth that needs to speak to us in those, in those times. So yeah. She leaned Absolutely. on that quite a bit. You know? Yeah, she did. Yep. Yep. Um, the part where the president sends the national guard in mm. to protect them. Uh, mm -hmm. They each had like two bodyguards. Is that right? Two soldiers mm -hmm. with them all the time. And she writes about, she says this answers to our prayers may not always appear in the form we imagine. Sometimes God sends angels in combat boots to protect us. Mm -hmm. And I think what she was saying there is, um, you know, this isn't what I didn't pray for these men, these soldiers to walk with me, but I'm finding God's answer to my prayer that I'm scared mm -hmm. in the presence of them. And I just wonder if that are there times you think that you can recall that you've prayed for or about something and realize that God did it in a very different way than you could have imagined, you know, I think those things strengthen our faith when we see God's provision for us mm -hmm. and we recognize that he's doing something, even though we didn't figure it out that way for ourselves. Does that make sense? Am I saying that? Yeah. You know, I don't know. What do you guys think about that? just in the last little bit of time? You know, I, as we lift up prayers, we often have our agenda, our heart's agenda, mm -hmm. you know, that we lift up, but I'm learning God always, always answers prayer. Mm -hmm. It's just not always the answer we're anticipating mm -hmm. or wanting mm -hmm. or, you know, so when, you know, when people pray for healing or when people pray, you know, about something, he'll always answer it always. Mm -hmm. But if we're, if it's not the, what kind of like what you're saying, if it's not what we're anticipating or how we think it should be, we don't, we don't see it as an answer. Um, but we almost sometimes don't, the answer is no. And we almost don't wait. receive it at all. Right. 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 Exactly. Acknowledge it I'm at all. That. Sometimes like, still, yeah, still waiting us. for the answer. Yeah. Still mm -hmm. waiting. That we want, mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you mm -hmm. know, he'll answer. And um, I don't know. I don't know. I've 
-hmm. that's been a, a, a recent epiphany for me. Like he always answers us. Yeah. I think the, the prayer thing, you know, we, we've talked about this before. Mm -hmm. Uh, I mean the, the four of us anyway, but th you know, that's something that can be a, a stumbling block to me because mm -hmm. I don't, I'm not one that prays for specific things. Mm -hmm. Like I just, yeah, do. I don't do that. I, um, I really try my best to confess my fear, my anxiety, my worry. I kind of throw that kind of, you know, that I'm nervous about this. You know, that I'm down about this, you know, um, help open my heart to what you're doing. Right. Because that, because mm -hmm. I know it's like what Maria is saying, I know you're doing something. Mm -hmm. And right now my pride, I just confess it. Right. When I, I mean, I don't even know where I'm proud. I don't even know mm -hmm. how I'm doing it wrong, but I know because I feel this way I am. Does that make sense? And mm -hmm. so I'm so much more like clear, clear the cobwebs of my heart rather than, cause I don't know. I, I don't know. I have, um, I have prayed for the wrong thing too many times and only realized that it would have been the wrong thing had I got it like way after the fact that I didn't get right. it. So yes, does that make sense, Scarlett? Yeah. So I'm like, I'm kind of over those days where I think I know what to pray for, <laughs> like, you know, like specifically, because right. I'm like, uh-uh, no, that's it. It goes back to that verse I love so, more, so much, Psalm 37, 4, take delight in the Lord and he will give you the desires of your heart. Um, my job is to take delight and his job is to give me um, what he mm -hmm. knows I need. Uh, that's mm -hmm. the desires of my heart, right? Yeah, so um i would just say like yeah. for like a specific thing when you answer ask this question i immediately thought of my son um having hemophilia okay because, uh when i was having charlie i prayed that he would not have the same thing that my brother did and um and you know obviously that didn't happen um but but now like 11 years later i can see over and over again just the healing that that has happened that has happened in my family because Charlie's hemophilia is in our lives mm -hmm. because his hemophilia is not like my brother's. It's a totally different decade, a totally different scientific improvements and mm -hmm. all the things that come along with that. And I just had a conversation with my dad about this the other day and just how much different their lives are. And mm -hmm. Charlie's life will be so much better because mm -hmm. it's just different. And yeah almost like my parents needed to see mm. um that that it didn't have to be such a negative and it didn't have to be something that like wow. the family that's really oh. powerful can wow. i ask you a question so when you now do you know because i just don't know do you know the child has hemophilia before it's born or is that something you have to wait till it's born to know no you that you what you know like when they stab their little heels to uh -huh. see okay that, that's when that you know. is that is one of the tests to see okay. if they have some kind of weirdness about clotting okay and um, so i found out when he was he was at the hospital so what was it like for you can i ask when you had prayed for something mm -hmm. and then they stick your baby's heel and you realize that that's not what happened like kind of what was that like right away can i ask yeah they yeah. stuck him three times mm-hmm uh, because they thought it was wrong mm -hmm. when they already knew that that was a possibility to have hemophilia, which really made me mad. <laughs> baby, right? right? I'm yes, like, don't stick hemophilia, him. right? So you stuck him three <laughs> times. <laughs> 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 like what? Anyway, he's not uh, going to stop bleeding now, right? Yes. Right. Um, <laughs> I, I in the hospital. Um, one of my uh, older lady that I really loved was there in the room with me when we got the information. My parents were not there. Um, my sweet Alberta, Lee Sullivan's wife was there with me and um, she immediately grabbed me and like held me because I just burst out into sobs. Okay. Um, because in that moment, I thought all of our dreams and everything I ever thought was going to happen like just melted away because I'm all I could think about was my, my brother's life. Sure. Mm -hmm. Um, and I just went into another room by myself and just prayed mm -hmm. and was angry, mm -hmm. really angry. Mm -hmm. uh, but over time, like he just did so many good, like God did so guys, he did so many good things. Mm -hmm. Like my son is blessed. He does not have the bleeds that he should have. Mm -hmm. We've seen we, like, he has like less than 3% of what he needs to have. And he literally has never really had serious struggles mm. with it. We've had some hard times, but mm -hmm. it's everything really has gone so smoothly. But the very beginning, um, 
I was a wreck. Mm -hmm. I was pretty upset. I think that, thank you for sharing that with us this evening. Like really, because I think it points to everything we're talking about. It points to having someone with you that's ahead of you that can help you, right? It points to like praying and not getting the answer that you wanted. And it points to that house of cards and how sometimes when you're faced with an answer you don't want, it falls apart or it feels like it's falling apart. But then also now 11 years, you can say boldly, I see the hand of God in all of this, Mm, right? And so your story is such an encouragement to all of us. So thank you Mm. very much for sharing that with us this evening. I think it's exactly um, what we're talking about. One of you guys were going to add to that, I think, and I cut you off. No, you're saying no now. (laughs) Maria, maybe. (laughs) No, okay. (laughs) Um, Yeah, thank you. Yeah, Uh, we can't follow that. I know, I'm sorry. But that's immediately what I thought of. I know, that's exactly the moment that I just, it was like, yeah, the thing I dreaded, the thing Mm -hmm. I was like, do not do this to me, God. Yeah, and he did it. And I, now I'm like, I'm so thankful for hemophilia actually in our life to be quite honest, because my parents, like, that's a whole nother, that's a whole nother book club. Okay? Yeah. <laughs> and my parents have yeah. like, um, uh, just, I don't know, God has mm-hmm. like worked in their lives. Yeah. And I guess that's what I mean by he'll answer us. Like he'll yeah. always answer, you know, he, uh, you know, he heard your prayers, Scarlett, and he answered in a way that he knew he could equip you to, you know, to handle the answer. And so, um, I don't know. Because sometimes the answer is like, I'm doing something. Yeah. I feel like God says this to me sometimes I'm doing something sweetheart mm-hmm. that you cannot know about right yeah. now. And so what, what seems like a failure to you, cause that's so often like what happens to me or like, what seems like rejection or failure or those kind of things is actually a mm-hmm. pause because it's going to take you to something different that, mm-hmm. um, and I'm learn. I'm trying so hard to just learn better to trust him and say, this doesn't feel very good right now. Like you're saying, like your emotional, physical human response was, I asked you to do something for me and you didn't do it. And I'm hurting now. Right. Like that's, that's what that feels like. But can we, in that natural response, go to him and say, um, I feel like you'll let me down. And yet I know you have not, and I'm going to choose to trust you while you unfold this in my life. Right. Um, cause I think that's, that's our maturing. That's the faith that's maturing in us. Mm-hmm. When we say, I feel both things. I'm mm-hmm. confident that you see me and you know me and you love me and my pictures are on your refrigerator. And I feel really mm-hmm. bad about this right now. Like both of these things are true at the same time. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. 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 Beautiful. I thought one, of, so she had this brief exchange with Dr. Martin Luther King in the book. And, um, when they were talking, he warned her not to be selfish. Do you remember this part? Oh, and yeah. I thought that was so interesting. Um, Dr. King said she was doing this, the integration, not for herself, but for generations unborn. And mm. she realized that she'd been waiting for others to change. Oh, done, done. Right. Uh, <laughs> others to change when it might be her that needed to change. Mm. And so the question that I kind of had around that was like, how is our faith affected by our willingness to surrender to God's plan over making our own way? I'm going to go back to Scarlett's story, because if you could have in your power, not had your child have hemophilia, right? Like I, in that, wouldn't you have done that? Like, aren't there things that like, yes. if we could do it ourselves? I'm going to take care of this. I was talking to somebody just today. um, And I I said, you know, so often I'm like, if you just show me the destination, just show me the destination, I'll get us there. You know? Mm -hmm. And he's like, sweetheart, I don't need you to get us there. I need you to take the next step. Like I'm going to get us there. You don't even know where there is, you know? And, um, but I think when we try to make our own way, um, the, the real act of faith is surrendering our own way. I think, I don't know what you guys think. Have you had that experience before too? I think probably. Mm-hmm. yeah well I, I thought it was quite bold of him to tell her she was being selfish because it was a big ask mm-hmm. from a human I don't, that mm-hmm. was that's not the the god side of it but I just thought that mm-hmm. that was a huge ask of those kids to do that with so the struggle young. that came with it absolutely mm-hmm. and for him to tell her she was being selfish see mm-hmm. I, that kind of rubbed me wrong a little bit mm-hmm. I thought they needed a little bit more encouragement and softness mm-hmm. But mm-hmm. it seemed to work for her. It, it shifted her thinking. And I think that's kind of what you're getting at. Mm-hmm. It, it's a shift in your thinking, you know, yeah. when God says, no, I think this, and you go, oh, you know, and if mm-hmm. you can trust mm-hmm. and shift your thinking a little bit, you might um, see the way. Mm-hmm. I don't know how to answer mm-hmm. that. No, you are answering it. Yeah. I think, um, I think when we get so focused on what, either what we want or mm-hmm. what we've lost, or when we get so self-focused, 
in, in one way yeah. or another, right? When we get so self-focused, I think we lose sight of what God is trying to do through us mm-hmm. or wanting to do through us or inviting us to do with him. Like what, you know, the work that he's inviting us to be a part of with him. Um, and I, because this is too hard. Yeah. 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 The, you know, and, and we're, and we're so not willing to wait. Mm. I need an answer right now. Mm. You know, I need to know how this is going to work out right now. And if you're not going to tell me right now, well, then I, cause I would rather have a situation that is like certain, I think, I mean, maybe I'm the only one, but I would rather like at least know no. what's going to happen, even if it's not my preferred outcome than to wait for you to do it. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. And, uh, that, that happens to me. I had a pastor friend of mine one time that talked about the difference between breaking down doors and allowing God to open them because so much like, cause he was kind of like, you know, we're smart people, right? We're resourced We're we can make things happen. We can break down doors. We can get things done, but will we look at, you know, maybe a line of closed doors and prayerfully submissively say, which one, which mm. one would you open for me? I think I want that one, but which mm. one will you open mm. for me? Mm. Yeah. I thought, I thought about that a lot that he probably said that like 10 years or so ago. And I've thought about that a lot. So, um, I think also like about the MLK thing is that like, she didn't see like, she almost like reminding her like, this is worth it. And maybe you're not going to see why it's worth it, but Mm. it's, it's for the people that are Mm. later. And so like, Mm -hmm. she's lived her life now. And so she Mm -hmm. sees like, Mm -hmm. wow, I really, that was really important that I did that. But like, and then I just think that wasn't really that long, long ago. I know. Isn't it crazy how not very long ago it was? Yeah. It's Mm -hmm. kind of, it's kind of actually like, um, like makes me kind of want to sigh a little bit. Cause I'm like, okay, if we can move that much in mm-hmm. less than a generation, mm-hmm. right. We going to move some more. Mm-hmm. Like, you know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. Like, I just yeah. think it's just sometimes in like, when you get into those situations where you're like, okay, I can't be about me right now. Mm-hmm. I have to be about what's going to happen later. Mm-hmm. What's my mm-hmm. legacy? How am I going to pass mm-hmm. this down to my kids? But then sometimes you gotta ask yourself, like, is it worth it? Like the pain right now that mm-hmm. I'm doing this in, is it worth it mm-hmm. in the long run? I, that makes me think of something that happened to me uh, when I was <clears throat> when I was in high school and I was abused by a teacher. One of the people in the community um, came to me to talk to me about it because he understood what was going on when other people didn't yet. And what he said to me at the time was, um, "This has been going on a long time." And he said, "And I've been watching it." And he said, "I've been waiting for my Angie Gilbert for a long time," which my maiden name was Gilbert. And I didn't know what he meant then. I really didn't understand, but I understand now that he mm-hmm. believed that I could do something, that I could say something that the other girls, not because I was better than them by any stretch of the imagination, but that perhaps they were more broken or more, I don't know, something. Mm-hmm. Um, and at the time, I'm probably like Melba in this situation, I wouldn't, I didn't, like I'm in a heck of a mess and I don't need any pressure um, Mm. from anybody else Mm -hmm. telling me what I need to do. I need to leave this town with my tail between my legs and find, figure out how to start a new life. And he was asking me to stand up and say what had happened to me and Mm. to think in some ways, I really hadn't thought about this until just now when we were talking about it, but in in some ways, not think of yourself. Like Mm -hmm. it is time that this stops. Um, It's been going on for too long. Mm-hmm. And it's time that this stops and you mm-hmm. have like evidence, right? This is a different situation, but yeah. you have evidence that you can share that might make it stop. Um, but I will say when I opened my mouth to try to do that, it got much worse um, socially um, than if I, and for a long time, and maybe still to a certain degree, I wonder if it was worth it, what, was there any good that came out of that? Because you don't know, um, you don't know the girls that he didn't do that to, mm-hmm. like, you don't get to know that. Right. And so, um, for a long time, my prayer was one of anger where I thought it would have been worth something. And it wasn't like, I kind of threw that accusation at God and it took me a long time to realize that so much about what it was for was inside me anyway. Right. I mean, it was really inside me. Um, and hopefully, hopefully, right. It was, um, it has, it was a a producer of some good. Yeah. As well. So, um, 
Yeah. Mm. That made me think of that. I didn't think about that when I was there. Melanie is saying, Lisa, your sister's on. Okay. She's saying hello. Um, that, hello, <laughs> Melanie. I really relate to that. I need to know the answer now and how it's going to work. If you don't tell me, then I'll just do it. Yeah. You're, yeah. I think we're not alone in that, Melanie. I think a lot. Mm. And Nancy says about the situation with your son, that it sounds like a test almost um, like um, the, like sometimes the, the tests we think, I think we get this really wrong idea about God and his mm-hmm. tests. Um, we think that they're so that he will know what we will do. Right. But so much his testing is about so that we, so that it will bubble up. It, we, it will, it will shine a light on where we are right with our faith. Um, and, um, but he, because he lovingly, it's not a pass fail and we're, he's going to be mad at us. Right. right. It's an invitation to um, cling to me, abide mm-hmm. in me, uh, trust me a little bit deeper. Right. And, um, so yeah. Um, what else we've been on here for a while. We didn't get to everything that wow. was on our little list there. I know, but, um, this has been good stuff. This went in a direction. I would have no, uh, no <laughs> anticipation, but I love it. Yeah. I'm glad that it brought up that kind of stuff for us. Cause it's so, I think it's so crucial as Jesus followers that we recognize that those tough places are, are places that can be so impactful in strengthening our faith. Yeah, absolutely. But anything else from the book? What else did you guys like or anything else that stood out to you about her life or? It was amazing, you know, her accomplishments Mm -hmm. after all of that, um, Mm -hmm. you know, and raising her children and Mm -hmm. we have much work to do. Like Scarlett said, we've, I think we've done, we, um, it's, it's always, I'm always a little bit nervous for white girls sitting here talking about what is or is mm-hmm. not happening in race relations. But, um, you know, I think we, we've done good work. We must do better. Mm-hmm. We, we, you know, we must do better. Um, and, um, I was watching something, a friend of mine posted something just this week on Facebook about, um, hate a white supremacist group that was on her child's college campus. Um, and I don't even, I honestly don't even know what the point was except just stirring up hate and anger and it was just um it was horrible like it was just horrific to look at that and realize that that's just a real part of our world still and um you know the thing that i always am just seeking is how do i how what how, what can i do um to make myself more aware and better um you know uh, better at this. So, and part of it is, I, you know, and I encourage all of you, um, I have a, 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 a friend, acquaintance friend, Laura J hunt is her name and her website is laurajhunt.com. I'll put it in the comments and she has a reading list. Um, she's done a lot of this work and she was, she's been on the page before and she has a reading list of things that have really helped her as she began to understand the, 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 the issue of racial inequality. And, um, I'll put that list in the, in the comments and in the show notes and stuff for this, just so if, cause if you're interested, but I think one of the things we can do is educate ourselves. Mm-hmm. Um, we can, we can educate ourselves on what it has been like and what the current problems still very much are mm-hmm. because they are real. So, yeah. Well, and we just, as, as white people, we just need to understand that like the cost yeah. for justice and mm-hmm. for, um, racial equality mm-hmm. is high mm-hmm. and, and we need to be brave and be mm-hmm. uncomfortable. Yes. And put ourselves in situations where maybe we're humbled yes. a little bit and yes. we ask hard questions of each other. And mm-hmm. we, we, I don't know, we just, you, we got to be willing to be uncomfortable. Like reading this girl, the way that girl was treated, mm-hmm. she was in high school mm-hmm. and um, I don't know, I don't ever, I don't remember, was there any white kid that came to her aid? No, well, that's what I kind of think about. And I, I, was saying thinking about this earlier about when Jesus came in to Pontius Pilate and the whole mob was against him and and where would I be in that you mm-hmm. know would I be one of the ones slinging and I thought about that a lot when um I was reading this book those white kids at that school that could have been any of us you know at that time absolutely would I have taken a stand uh want to would you know it was really scary you know you can't I can't sit here and say that I would have taken a stand but it just yeah. sickens me when I read it and and I want to take a stand on that um, on that Oprah that that I was talking about earlier, and I wish I'd have read. I've watched it uh, maybe a month or two ago, and now I'm losing some of the details. But there was one girl on there that they kept talking about um, who was nice to them, okay. and it was so interesting because if I remember correctly, basically what she did 
was she wasn't mean and she smiled at them and she had yeah. a warm expression and she yeah. was like, cause I thought, well, you know, what, what did, what was being nice to yes. them? What did that look like? And it was just like, it was almost like it was not participating and she smiled at them. Oh, like, you know, yep. and, um, I thought, wow, sometimes like that doesn't seem like that's good enough, but in the, in the situation that they were in, right. Mm -hmm. Um, my friend, Laura Hunt mentioned that at one point where she talked about, she's like, I talk about this imperfect perfectly. She's a white woman too, but she's, but what people have come to her and said how much they appreciate how much she's doing. She feels like, she's like, I'm not doing anything, mm -hmm. but it's just like, we have to be teaching ourselves. I guess I just, you know, we have to be reading and learning. And, um, I, yeah, I think so. one of the things that now that you said that, when she went out to California, it was yes. California with the fan, the yes. Quaker family that took her in mm -hmm. and they were white. Mm -hmm. And she was kind of afraid of that for a while. She was she very always, afraid of that. You know, and I loved those people. And I'm like, yes, that's how I wanted to be. Mm -hmm. I wanted to be those people, mm -hmm. yes. you know, bringing in here in total acceptance and just know. Well, you know, and I remember I that, that one part of the book where she said I was beginning to think there was a possibility that not all white yes, people would treat right. me like that, right. you yes, know? And amen. so, yeah. And getting to know someone uh, mm -hmm. closely, but I can imagine how I can't actually, I won't even right. say I can, I can, I can believe how terrifying that would have been to show up there when she transferred schools and realized that she was going to be living with a white family when she'd come from Arkansas yeah. and all that she'd been through and think she'd probably been sent out there to be killed in her sleep. Yep. Right. Yep. Like that. Yeah. Um, so, and even there where the, where the culture was different, the family that took her in, remember that they, they oh, yeah. took they a lot of, they, yeah, yeah, mm -hmm. absolutely. yeah, yeah. So. but they were pretty firm about their, yeah. you know, yeah, they were, they held I their ground. That yeah, part. I did yep. too. I did too. They were an inspiration. I love so, that the um, dad went and got her a black dude to date. Yeah. <laughs> There's no good black guys around here. Well, that's what he said. I know. <laughs> I forgot that. You're so right. No, <laughs> I'm like, now that is precious. Yes. Yeah. He's like, listen, I'm going to try to help you out. Yeah. <laughs> I love it. Oh, wow. oh. Well, I love you ladies. And I'm glad we uh, read this together. Thank you very much for joining me on this. Mm -hmm. And um, we're going to sign out, I think next month for October. Um, we're going to have an, we're going to have the author on Aaron Bartles is going to be on to talk about the words between us. Mm. And, um, she's, she, I think it's, she's going to be delightful. I will tell you, I emailed her, we've been emailing back and forth and I learned, I have learned that she really enjoys consignment shopping. So I told her to prepare herself. Uh, cause I said, we, we're going to need to know about that. We're going to need to know about <laughs> your love of consignment shopping. And she said to me, ladies, she's like, I'll talk about anything you want to. So I thought, okay. <laughs> <laughs> So I'm looking forward to having her on and getting to know her a little bit. So thank you all for who are, who've been watching live and um, anybody who catches this later, we appreciate it. And um, until next time, peace. Bye. I had a wonderful time with my friends sharing how the book touched our hearts and remembering times when our faith has grown through trials. I will think often of the words Dr. Martin Luther King shared with Melba in the midst of her struggles to remember she was doing this not only for herself, but for generations yet unborn. Friends, what in faith are we doing for those who come behind us? Thank you so much for listening. I pray that wherever your day takes you, you are walking in the confident knowledge that you are a beloved, cherished child of God. Peace.